Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to PQ Talks, our final day with PQ Talks. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Barbara Přihodová, who is the curator of, of PQ Talks, for having us. Uh, my name is Pavel Drábek. I'm the curator of Best Publication Award, but I'm also co-moderating uh, the PQ Talks. Uh, a little bit of introduction before I introduce uh, our panelists today. So this is the uh, Knowledge Exchange Platform Roundtable. Now, what is Knowledge Exchange and what is PQ Knowledge Exchange? Uh, I'll start with a little uh, anecdote, uh, which probably was the trigger behind what we are doing. Uh, not what these people are doing, but what PQ is doing. So after last PQ, uh, a uh, renowned journal approached many of us uh, as curators, as organizers who were involved in PQ, uh, because they were doing a special issue on PQ. And uh, one, of the, one of the directors went through the entire peer review process. It was very arduous and long and uh, boring and demanding and frustrating. And eventually when the, when the journal came out uh, online, uh, there was a paywall, so anyone who wanted to read that journal essay that that person or many of us wrote entirely for free in our free time just to promote PQ, anyone who wanted to read our work had to either be at a very rich university that has subscription or had to be uh, wealthy enough or I don't know what, uh, but pay to read the things that we did entirely for free out of goodwill. and. Uh, that discussion, we had a discussion with Marketa Fantova, the artistic director, and uh, we thought, well, we can't do this. Uh, this cannot go on. And uh, at that point, we uh, started uh, the PQ Knowledge Exchange platform. So uh, that's something. Now, what is knowledge exchange? Knowledge exchange is, uh, in some countries, a term. Uh, that's promoting the exchange of knowledge between the academia, the third sector, as some countries, some cultures call it, and the industry. That means people who are not academics. And you will know, those of you who work at universities or uh, have gone into research activities at universities, that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of journals uh, pretty much in every field. Uh, many of them are uh, run by uh, other universities, many, but many of them are also run by publishers, and these publishers are commercial publishers. And uh, those commercial publishers are operating what I and several people who are behind Peak Knowledge Exchange Platform uh, consider to be very dubious or problematic ethically, uh, because uh, it is basically using the fact that we as, uh, as academics need to publish, otherwise we can't be, uh, go for promotion, or we are, can't prove that we are research active, that, and if we are not research active, that means for some managers and administrators that we are going down in our qualifications. So basically we've got to publish, and the nature of certain world and I would say it's a very colonial world in my, in my view, uh, is that you've got to publish with the best of the best of the best who control the world of knowledge. And I'm putting it intentionally in this kind of provocative way uh, just to highlight that there is some kind of ethical issue at heart. And what we did was uh, promote knowledge exchange, this knowledge exchange platform. So if you type in PQ knowledge exchange platform, you'll, st you'll find uh, a website under pq.cz that uh, front loads five, at the moment, five uh, partners uh, who are journals or initiatives or collectives uh, who, who do open access but not just any open access, but very high quality, very carefully curated uh, work that has high standards uh, and uh, that is free for everyone to use. And we as PQ, uh, as part of Knowledge Exchange Platform, would like to promote that. Uh, the five 
speakers the who are on the panel are representatives of those five partners of official partners of PQ and they will speak one after another about who what they are doing what their platform is what journal it is etc uh, I would also like to say a little bit more about how we are going to use the PQ knowledge exchange platform uh, the there have been over 70 books submitted to the uh, to the best publication award uh, from about 20 countries, fascinating works. We have asked everyone to submit uh, to submit uh, hard copies, if hard copies exist, a PDF that's to help the jury uh, select it, but also to exhibit those books. And we've also asked every author to do a video, a short video of five, seven minutes in English to talk us through that book. So that everyone, no matter if they can read Lithuanian or Greek or uh, uh, Argentinian Spanish or Portuguese, can access and, is, and see the sophistication that goes into that book. We've got those videos and in a few weeks time, we'll be putting that, those, those up. Uh, on the knowledge exchange platform so that it really becomes, as we hope, a hub of exchanging knowledges between scholars, publishers, uh, thinkers, practitioners, the industry, and learners, students, whoever wants, without a paywall. And it is the shared uh, agreement between partners on the PQ knowledge exchange platform that is that we will promote one another, we will keep the standards high, but we will promote uh, open access. So the way we will go, we'll have five speakers, I'll introduce them one after another. Very briefly, uh, after those five presentations, we, will have, we would like to open up the discussion about where we wa are with sharing knowledge, with exchanging knowledge because that is, what I think, one of the main purposes of a festival and something so unique as, or rare, as PQ, that we come here and that we share knowledge, exchange it. But also, we can do it when we have left, when we are gone and away. Is that a fair way to start? Okay, wonderful. So, our first panelist is Teresa Stahlikova. Uh, who is uh, behind the initiative, a journal, online journal called Tangible Territory. Uh, you know, know Teresa because she's also running uh, workshops for PQ and she's a, a wonderful artist and a scholar. Uh, so Teresa, over to you if you would like to say something about what is Tangible Territory? Why are you doing it? What is this? Thank you, thank you. Well, and um, yes, so I'm going to do a very kind of informal, brief introduction to my journal. Um, let's just, uh, uh, can we switch them uh, to the uh, to the PowerPoint to the main screen, please? Just so yeah. you can yeah. see. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's basically um, so. Just to give you a little bit about the context of how it all started, it's. Uh, it began in the pandemic, uh, right sort of in the middle of it, uh, and it came out of my own frustration with being sort of having to stop all the project. It was just after the previous PQ, so all the energy of working with people and also my sort of own interest in sensory perception and the body embodiment uh, and collaborative practice. So all of these things, as many of you I'm sure had the same experience, it all ceased to be possible and I first I just felt totally uh, like lost and then I thought okay maybe how can I sort of work with this how can I use the opportunity to start something um, different so I decided to uh, to start this uh, journal tangible territory it's it's actually maybe more precise to call it a a sort of platform a collective uh, where where the idea is that in the very beginning, it was about uh, finding a platform to discuss this uh, crazy thing happening to us, this uh, sort of sudden shift into audio-visual communication with all the Zoom and all the technology, so this sort of accelerated push towards uh, virtual encounters and my kind of interest in questioning to what's happening to all our other senses. 
as that is uh, yeah, sort of being left behind. And then I thought, well, and that's a great opportunity to invite all the people that I know um, to start this dialogue uh, and become very connected in this world of sort of art, science, philosophy. Uh, so I first approached basically people that I already knew and, and this first issue emerged. Um, so the journal is a kind of mix uh, between, um, it's very, very cross-disciplinary and it's very cross sort of form as well. So because it's digital, which has some of its own issues, but it also has a lot of great things about it, it means that I can also include moving image work, audio work, uh, I can have photography, I can have uh, basically all kinds of different shapes and forms. And, uh, and, and it's, it's so, so the sort of main focus of it is, is sensory perception, embodiment, uh, digital uh, well, technology, the impact of technology on the creative process. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's very broad in the sense that, so it's got this very specific focus on one hand, but it actually has a very sort of broad uh, possibility for people to come from very different disciplines. So I've got uh, basically uh, anthropologists, philosophers, experiment psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, and some of the people are on very, very high level um, and, uh, and basically, just to sort of give you even more of the context that I should just change, this is basically just a screenshot of the website that's accessible to anyone who just has the link and um, all the issues are there. I now have five different, five issues. Uh, I've got roughly 12, 13 contribution in each one. Um, and, and basically, uh, I am doing it at the moment. <laughs> I'm doing it totally uh, without funding. Um, I'm doing it with, uh, through my connections. It's not a peer-reviewed journal at this point. I think there is a sort of idea of shifting it. I need to develop it, but at this point, it still has this freedom of actually not having this whole process of peer reviewing. Of course, I have editors who sort of go through it as well, sort of guest editors. Uh, but otherwise, it's very, very sort of um, flexible in this sense. And what I found very, very striking is that people, uh, that I can approach people like, I don't know, William Kentridge or Lev Manovich, and, uh, and they open to it. They open to it and they contribute things as well. So I've got some very sort of high level academic contributions in it, but then I also have to, like uh, one of my students in it. So it's, it's very kind of like uh, just at any level that doesn't uh, trouble me. I want to be able to sort of bring all these different voices into it, uh, sort of joined by the curiosity and give people chance, like no matter how much experience they've got. Um, um, so the just just uh, I don't know how long I've been talking for. <laughs> so okay, so I still got time. So I'm trying to sort of thematize it as well. So each issue has a kind of a sub theme as well. Um, one of them, for example, was, uh, so I'm very interested in the role of place and space uh, and how that affects our um, sort of understanding of whether it's narrative, but of ourselves as well. Um, and so, for example, one of the issues was focused um, on the on that, so then I had people again reflecting on it very, from very, very different angles, but all sort of connected with this interest in idea of home, of psychogeography, uh, sort of influences like Gaston Bachelard and, and, and so on. I had a Harvard professor, Juliana Bruno, contributing. Um, so it was again like a real eclectic sort of mix of uh, uh, voices. Um, I should mention in connection with that, that the project that some of you might have uh, participated in, which is called the Infraordinary Lab, which is still running today till five o'clock, is, is very much connected to tangible territory. It's very much about the idea of working with place. Uh, in this particular case, it's working with the location of the Holoshevitz car market. Um, it's, it's sort of accessing the embodied uh, history of it and paying attention to our bodies as well. 
Uh, and maybe the final thing I wanted to say uh, is that um, there, was, there was an open call which uh, has been closed, but it's, uh, as things are still quite fluid, <laughs> there is still a possibility if anyone wanted to get in touch. So the latest issue is focused on play. Uh, so I've, I've, I'm still open to a few more submissions uh, and basically just very briefly the idea of play in a sense of um, a kind of creative process, an open-ended process where it's not goal-driven. Um, I'm interested in aspects of, again, sort of uh, embodiment. So as we go moving towards uh, artificial intelligence and all these things that are very much sort of end goal driven, I'm more and more, uh, and I'm sure other people are more and more interested in, in, in the actual process of things because we're doing things uh, not because of the result. We, we're making things because we... We love doing them and because we, we find something about ourselves through doing them. So, for example, for me, the idea of using chat GTP uh, would make no sense unless it was something totally boring. Because I actually, uh, it, uh, writing helps me understand and process things. Um, so, yeah, so that's it. That's tangibleterritory.art. You can find it online. All the issues are there. And if anyone wants to submit anything, I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, I'm very glad that you could be here to talk about tangible territories. I'm a great admirer. And we, with my MA students, we have been uh, looking into those issues with great appreciation. Uh, our second panelist is Brad Kalbli. Uh, those of you who were involved in PQ 2019, shall I mean PQ 2019? Uh, those of you who were involved in PQ 2019 will remember Brad as as uh, uh, one of the uh, directors managers. Uh, Brad is. Uh, uh, now based at the Royal Welsh uh, College of, Art, of Mus Music and Drama, uh, teaching sonography, uh, but he's also behind behind uh, an online journal, Ascending, and that's why uh, Brad is here today with us. Brad, over to you. What is Ascending? Wonderful. Um, yeah, I think they're going to... There we go. Um, so Ascending is, as Pavel said, is an, is an online journal. Uh, focused on emerging, specifically emerging, performance designers, sonographers, and visual dramaturgs, trying to be as inclusive as possible in what everyone likes to call themselves, their different practices. Um, and this really came out of, it was kind of three inciting things that kind of, we started right after the last PQ, so in autumn of 2019, and published our first, what we call an act in our first folio in um, the spring of 2020. Um, and that was one that I sat in a lot of meetings and was what I called the um, obnoxious under 30 year old where I just felt like constantly people were kind of talking about what it was like to be an emerging designer who hadn't been an emerging designer in quite a long time. And what they were describing as that experience really didn't resonate with me or with any of the, my other colleagues who were my age. So I felt like there really was space and need for a place for those people's stories to be shared and for their perspective to really come to the forefront. Um, Second in that was, by working with PQ, it became so interesting to me how many different, how those experiences are so different for people from different parts of the world. So what it's like to be an emerging designer in France might be completely different than what it's like to be in America or in Australia or in China or in India or um, in Africa. And that, that was really interesting to me. And I really wanted a place that we could start to collate those different experiences. And then thirdly, um, I recognized that uh, as a person who had immigrated, so I'm an American who live, has lived in the Czech Republic for two years and also now resides in the UK, uh, and I recognize that I'm a person with a fair amount of privilege in my life, and it's still really hard. It's really hard to immigrate. Somebody brought it up yesterday about visas and how hard it is to get a visa to go do something. And... Um, and one of those really important things as an artist when you're trying to get a visa to go to live in another country or to visit another country is that uh, being published is a great check mark in trying to get those visas because it gives you some sort of clout. It, it, because often what they're not looking for at is the quality of your art, but the recognition from your industry of the quality of your art, which is a very different thing. 
Um, and obviously that's quite difficult for emerging designers. Um, they're often not making the work that's getting the recognition of, of established um, publications. So it was, I thought, oh, this is another great way. And actually there's been a couple of people who've been able to use, having been published with us, that that has then gone. They've written me and said, oh, can you send me a PDF copy? Can you, you know, send me some more information about how many readers you have so that I can use this to help me get a visa or to travel to go to a conference or something. So that's, those were kind of the inciting bits. So we've, we publish also biannually. These are just some screen captures of our cover images. So um, we publish uh, twice a year, usually around April, May, and around October, November. Um, we organize ourselves, um, so we call them folios, because they're uh, basically in the way we were created is the idea that a group of emerging designers would run it until the next PQ. And then after this PQ, that another group of emerging designers would take it over and run it, maybe with some continued involvement from me, but really with their own point of view. Um, so we're kind of calling them folios as kind of collections of that group of editors, um, and then an act inside each one of those. Um, I'm just going to check my notes so I tell you all the highlights. Um, ta -ta -ta. So in that, we, um, we publish a really wide range of work. So we, we publish work in kind of, our ethos is about allowing those artists, so I call it, I call it the Kate Bailey approach. I don't know if any of you know Kate Bailey, she's a curator of the VNA. But one thing that also I learned from the last, I, I got involved really with PQ in 2015 and World Stage Design in 2013, so I'm now at my decade mark of being involved in these things, is that I think, I think performance designers are quite judgy about each other. <laughs> Maybe not a popular thing to say. Um, there's a lot in kind of private conversations around the value of what, what as a performance designer or sonographer, what work has value. And what I've always loved about Kate is that she values all of it. And the way that she talks with equal excitement about a huge commercial musical as she does about some community project in the middle of a forest somewhere that's completely made sustainably um, has always really inspired me. So we try to take that ethos into our work, that we value research-based work, work that's coming from more commercial, traditional places, work that's existing text, new text, that we value all of that work. We kind of don't pass judgment on the value of those types of work, but instead looking at the quality of the work within those kind of pathways. Um, so that, and then also we, we really try to not limit our artists and what they talk about or how they talk about it. So part of that is that we've actually been quasi-successful. We ask each artist who contributes we give them the option to publish their work bilingually, so in their native language or in the language where they're studying or, or wherever they call home, as well as in English. Um, and I think that's also been a really exciting thing to undertake. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult thing sometimes to facilitate. Um, and part of that has also been about accepting, so we don't really edit, we edit for grammar or for spelling, but we don't, actually kind of uh, some editors word for people who is English as their second language and a lot of what I did for PQ, uh, which was rewriting people's texts into kind of better, um, in a really negative way, English. Um, so we kind of leave how they've said it, how they say it. Um, and I think there's something really powerful about kind of hearing, because what it also means is that it becomes quite conversational in hearing them talk about their work. Um, even reading it, you get a sense of kind of who they are and I think that's, so that's been really important to us. Um, and we publish work in four categories. So these are some more screen captures of our website. Um, so we publish either artist interviews, we publish um, research-based work, we publish um, industry perspectives from emerging designers, and we also publish what, called, what we call quick takes, which are basically we, we publish a prompt and we ask people to respond in kind of 100 words or so, um, which kind of allows more people's opinions around subjects to kind of come forward. Um, and we, we allow people to self-identify. So that was another important thing that I learned from PQ is, again, what an emerging designer means um, can mean something very different to a lot of different people, uh, depending on where you're from culturally. So we don't, we, you know, we don't have a rule that it's like this many years or you can't have done this. And um, we ask people to kind of self-identify. There's been three instances where I think someone really stretched that. Um, <laughs> I think they knew they weren't really an emerging designer. Um, the first two we kind of let slide because I kind of didn't catch it um, through one of the other editors until quite late in the process and then I felt quite bad about going back to them and saying, oh no, actually we're not going to publish your interview or your article or whatever. But the third one we caught earlier on, so I did kind of kibosh it. But um, no, uh, so that's, that's another big part of it. Um, I could get, talk about all these things for ages, so I'm just trying to be succinct in my, in my conversation about it. Um, so yeah, so these are just some of the challenges that we face. 
um, or that we face, so we are completely, um, so first of all, the demographic. And when I said I wanted to start this magazine, um, we've been really well supported by three really, Tanya being one of them. Um, and then Patrick, who runs the PQ Studio, and then this publisher in London named Helen, who is the aunt of one of my friends randomly, um, who saw me post something about it on Facebook and got involved and really helped me kind of navigate those early days. Um, but Patrick said to me immediately, he was like, this is like the hardest demographic <laughs> to try to both target and solicit work from. Because Emerging Designs are no longer affiliated with institutions, but their work isn't big enough that you're gonna like come across it. And that has been quite difficult. There are also, again, we are, we are completely, because we are free, we're, I'm, it's self-funded by me, I pay for everything, um, personally, and so we don't pay anybody for their contributions. Also, emerging designers are often working a lot, and you know, even if they agree, normally we have about 30% of our agreed contributions never arrive, um, and also the team has other things going on in their lives, so they kind of dip in and out sometimes. You know, there are some issues which I basically kind of published completely on my own, and there's somewhere there were maybe six or seven people helping contribute. So the demographic is quite difficult to both manage and to keep up with, and that also comes with the unpaid startup bit at the bottom. And honestly, we also really struggled with legitimacy. Um, we actually had people that told, I mean, we had articles that were pulled because somebody's professor told them that they shouldn't publish with us, that we weren't important enough that there wasn't value in publishing with us, um, and that was kind of quite last minute. Um, so that, you know, we struggled with that a bit. I also am not an academic. Um, I'm slowly being trying to coerced into being an academic by my institution, but um, I do write quite well, but it's, so it's also, there were some things I didn't really understand, and that, you know, so we are, we do peer review um, research-based work, but only that small bit of it. And, um, but we are like, we got registered as an ISSN, so that that gives us some legitimacy. Again, it was all these questions around like, what made it a proper publication and what allowed it to kind of be seen as something worthwhile in a lot of people's eyes. Um, and again, also the quality of that work, right? So we're not publishing major national, you know, often emerging designers are not working on major, huge, internationally recognized pieces of work. So sometimes I get really frustrated secretly with like, you know, there's a, there's a couple of social media accounts that just kind of share beautiful images that they don't credit at all of like big theater productions that have huge followings. Um, but it's like, we, we don't, the work we share, there is actually some really stunningly beautiful work. And it's been a great joy to share that work with people because I think it's really a shame that we don't see more of that work out and about just because they're not at kind of major institutions. Um, and also like, I was very aware that like, we trying to reach beyond our networks. So obviously what was interesting to me was, as I said, was about trying to get these really diverse perspectives. Um, but I recognize that like, even with PQ as a partner, there's still a limit to that network. So we were always trying to be really conscious about um, where we were from and not overly, you know, trying to balance out getting work from a lot of different places. Um, again, the legitimacy issue came in there. <clears throat> I mean, we, we would interview, lo we would email loads of universities, um, other professional artists that we knew through international connections uh, and say, oh, could, you know, who in your, or other publications in countries to be like, we're trying to connect with emerging designers in your country, we wanna hear more about what it's like there. And they just would either say, oh, it's not worth our time or um, just wouldn't he get back in touch with us. Um, so that could be really frustrating. So we were constantly trying to kind of find more wider perspectives, but it, it's actually quite a difficult, we found it, I found it quite difficult. Um, but some really great things. Um, so total in the last three years, we've published 71 articles, um, which includes over a thousand images of emerging designers' work. Um, what I would say is that it was a lot easier. We started in COVID, and, and as you probably, maybe some other people found in COVID, people were really keen to talk, like, to have something to do to write about their work. Um, so our initial couple of um, art um, editions had a really huge amount that came. So we, we opened through open calls. We have an open call for everything, and then we also invite works. We do a mix. Um, but we were, so we published over 1,000 images, uh, artists from 27 countries and in, in 12 languages that we were, we were able to publish. And we've had over 30,000 site visitors um, in the last three years. So that's a little bit about us. I think that's the end of my, yeah, that's the end of my, my presentation. Um, and I look forward to chatting more. Thank you very much, Brad, uh, for talking about ascending uh, the, this wonderful, wonderful journal. Uh, our third panelist is Sharka Havlíčková Kisová, who is the uh, editor, the general ed or editor-in-chief of, of Tatralia. Tatralia, uh, she's an associate professor at the University of, at Masaryk University in Brno, and some of you may have attended 
uh, our panel yesterday where she spoke about uh, sonographic research, sonography history, but also touched upon uh, cognitive science and sonography. Sharka, over to you. Thank you, Pavel, for inviting me to this panel. So I'm here for uh, for introducing Theatralia peer-reviewed journal, uh, which is published by our department in Brno, by the Department of Theatre Studies of Masaryk University. So we are supported by our faculty, or rather we, we are free to do it. Uh, so we are very glad. And uh, as Pavel said, uh, academic have to publish uh, the results of the work and I am glad uh, to say that academic uh, academics like and even love to publish and uh, they love their research sometimes sometimes not but they have to and they uh, they are willing to publish so we try to offer them space where they can do it. And we do it twice a year. We publish uh, issue twice a year. We have a couple of uh, sections where they can send their contributions. So uh, just basically to uh, introduce these sections, we have two peer review sections titled Yorick and Spectre. And these two sections are peer reviewed. And uh, the first one is uh, called thematic section. Uh, since, we, uh, uh, since we invite guest editors, every issue has uh, its general topic. So the guest editor or editors uh, Okay, uh, come up with uh, the topic and you can publish uh, an article in this uh, main, let's say, main section of this uh, particular issue. Uh, and for example, if you, uh, if you notice this flyer put all around here, one of the next issues will be focused on the reflection or of, the, of this PQ and on the uh, reflection of scenographic work. So next year, for example, uh, the issue will be edited by Vera Mena Velemanova and Aziza Kaderi. So this, uh, this will be uh, the first issue of 2024. And you can, if you are interested in scenography and uh, you are uh, you love to write about uh, scenography? Please send our, your proposal. Uh, the deadline was uh, postponed only yesterday, so you can send us your proposal by the end of the June, and uh, we will get in touch with you and we will discuss the possibility of uh, publishing with Theatralia. So this was the example of special or thematic uh, issue and thematic rubric. Uh, rubric. Uh, so the second peer review uh, section uh, titled uh, Spectre uh, includes uh, usually various topics. So you can send their, uh, send their article focused on almost everything connected somehow to the theatre and to your interest to theatre and similar things from theatre and culture and so on. And we have uh, other sections like, for example, orient orientation or where, where we publish especially uh, review, book reviews. So if you are interested in uh, special or some or, or on uh, in particular in reading particular book and um, write and review so please let us know we can ask for you for a review cup, a copy and you can send us the review and also we published uh, short articles uh, uh, about uh, interesting events connected uh, to our field of study. For example, when something so interesting as PQ takes place, we we ask somebody to write about this event, or uh, if uh, if a conference uh, is uh, somewhere around, so we try to uh, to. Um, 
give a message about this. And yes, uh, so please don't forget for this call for papers and please publish uh, in the one of the next issue of Theatralia. And yes, I forgot one uh, one uh, one very important uh, section of the journal. It's called just simply archive, uh, where we publish various material. It can it could be simple page of something very interesting, which uh, could attract the attention of the readers. It can be it can be picture. It can be. Uh, costume draft or something like that it could be it could be just um, just discovered a theoretical text and so on so there are various things uh, that we are interested uh, to publish and yes I must say we are very glad we gladly uh, give uh, opportunity also to the young writers to publish with Theatralia we, uh, we uh, love to have them there side by side with like more uh, established scholars and authors so uh, don't worry we can we can uh, we can, if you are younger, younger scholar, we, we can invite you as well. So uh, yes, that's quite general things. And yeah, uh, more two more practical information. Uh, so. Um, we are uh, list, uh, we are included in several uh, uh, databases uh, like Scopus and Eric uh, Plus, and we are, as Pavel introduced us, uh, open access, maybe Diamond open access, so uh, you can access your work, pub your published work, or published work of other people for free from everywhere, and we. Uh, we don't uh, pay, uh, uh, or the authors don't pay for uh, publishing with us, and we unfortunately uh, don't pay authors, but access to our journal is uh, completely free of charge. So, um, and... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for. So I have I brought with me some uh, some display copies of uh, older issues. Please uh, take a look at uh, them, and if you want, you can keep it. I won't <laughs> bring it to Brno back with me. And yes, uh, and who who are we? This is my last uh, slide. So I'm an uh, editor-in-chief and I've got uh, two really, or more than two, uh, but uh, these, uh, these two are very important, two collaborators. The first one is uh, Svetlana Shurma, English studies scholar, uh, who work, uh, works with me for a couple of years and basically uh, takes care about uh, English uh, English uh, or the issues in English. And we have a really great editor of uh, mostly Czech, uh, Czech issues, Eliška Rajtrova, uh, which, is, uh, which works uh, with us just over a year, but she's really professional at the moment. So, and we are uh, uh, also supported and, uh, by really excellent editorial board. And I must say that uh, uh, there is another uh, very important person for us because we more and more published in English and I have to, and I must mention Josh Overton, who is uh, our great uh, Reader and helps us to improve uh, the academic writing in English, and it's he's really of great help to us. And so we uh, we have to uh, meet all, and we try to meet all the requirements of academic writing. But still, we try, uh, we do our best to uh, make our contributions accessible interesting and just fresh so thank you uh, thank you very much Arka, for talking about Tatralia, uh, a journal I have very profound connections with for year, have had for years our fourth speaker 
perhaps does need introducing, uh, uh, Tanya Beer, uh, who will be talking about ecosonography. Tanya is, uh, of course, a, uh, I would say the, the world expert in ecosonography, a book that she, uh, she published, a book of that name, but she also has an initiative. And those of you who have been following Piku Talks, there was a, an entire day dedicated to uh, that uh, question, that topic. And I'm very pleased that uh, Tanya can be here with us to talk about what is ecosonography apart from a book and apart from a concept. Tanya, over to you. Have you got the clicker? Hi, everyone. Um, so um, I suppose the Ecosonography platform, which is essentially a website that I created in 2014, was coming out of directly out of my PhD, which I was doing at the same time. And I call myself a pracademic because I am both a practitioner and an academic. And when I started my PhD, I was really aware of that disconnect between academics and research and, and the way... Uh, practitioners work and I really wanted to make sure that the work that I was doing in ecosonography was uh, reaching broader audiences because I did not want to be one of those people that's uh, sitting in a room doing my research and not connecting um, with uh, performance designers that are trying to engage with this work. So for me it was very, very obvious from the very beginning that there needed to be some kind of open access platform and and also to realise as I stepped into academia after 10 years of practice to break out of those silos. So for me, it was a way, um, you know, it was a, quite an obvious choice. And as I was um, coming up with the idea or the concept of ecosonography, which was in 2014, isolated, particularly because I live in Australia, which is very far away from the rest of the world. And it was really important for me to start to build connections and to create a community um, and to see how ecosonography could work on a global scale. And it started really very much in 2014 when blogging was a thing. And I don't think it's so much a thing now. I think TikTok has probably taken over uh, along with other other social media forms and other publishing uh, ways of doing things. But at the time, blogging was the thing. And it was quite common also for academics to have a blog site or like a site like WordPress where they could disseminate their, their research uh, in, com in, in, in common language, I suppose, in inverted commas, um, in non-academic speak. And um, there, I'd noticed that there were a lot of scientists actually doing it where they were trying to in interpret their paper um, in a way that would reach broader audiences. So these are some of the original posts that I did, uh, the first one there from 2014, and I'm thinking now it's almost four It's almost 10 years ago, which is kind of amazing to think about where we've come from there. And it started off with me posting about, you know, sort of commentary about what I was seeing and what I was thinking through my research. It was a really great tool to um, try to, you know, also use that kind of writing um, to help me to articulate my research in a way that other people could also understand it. Um, and the way that I could articulate for a practitioner audience. Um, and then I started to invite other performance designers to also contribute their, like to also write a blog post essentially, which is about 700 words and to feature that on the site. So for me, it became about also forefronting other designers that were working in this way. And through that, we were starting to build a sense of community and Many of us felt very, back, you know, almost 10 years ago, many of us felt very isolated. We felt like we were working on the margins of theatre practice, doing what we were doing. So it was really important that we forefronted each other's work and, and celebrated what we were doing and, and built that discussion. So more recently, and, and also coming on board as part of uh, the PQ Knowledge Exchange, um, there was, um, I sort of took a bit of energy to then sort of update the site, which it really needed updating. Um, again, I don't do this, this is just something that I do on the side. I am an academic, so it gives me a very privileged position to be able to do this kind of stuff and, and essentially self-fund it. 
and um, and make make it open access and and spend the energy around it. So, my book, um, which came out in 2021, one of the issues that I have with my book is that it is very expensive, and it's not something that I realised would happen. It was not. Uh, the, the price of the book was not negotiated with me uh, before it was published and it's it's probably a heartbreak of mine that I have with the book, which I'm very proud of, is that it is so expensive and therefore inaccessible. And the whole point of ecosonography to me is that it's an inclusive way of working. So for me, that the, the price of the book makes it incredibly exclusive. So... Um, for me, it's very important to have this website which is open access so that at least I can still communicate with an audience that can't read, have ha access to the book. Um, the book and the website now work in tandem. So it also um, gives me more opportunity to feature the projects that I've done and I mentioned in the book in... Um, much bigger volume in terms of images, which I only have a certain number of images that I could have in the book. Also videos and also there I work a lot, um, a co-create uh, a lot of my work and I felt like I really wanted to make sure I honoured those collaborators and featured their work as much as possible and the book, you know, it doesn't do that enough. So for me, it's like a, a little, it's it's a tandem thing where you can go to the website and you can see and, and read about those projects in more detail. And one of the things that I did in development on my book is I, I did a number of interviews with eco-sonographers from around the world and I featured the full interviews on the platform as open access and then cited them in my book. Um, so everybody can go and see those interviews and um, get to know some of the ecosonographers that are really changing the way they practice in their, their own communities. And, and that was really popular because it's also very – lots of images as well because, um, you know, you can look at their work and you can, you can really get to know their work through the images um, of the work that they do. And, and that, again, I think has helped reinforce the community and, and, and bring people together. And several of these artists are here at PQ and um, they're featured in my book, but they're also part of the exhi exhibitions, um, which is really fantastic to, to see their work over the last few years really um, coming into the, um, the global zeitgeist of, of what is happening. We started in 2021, I wanted to be a bit more interactive and try and find a way to engage with people one-on-one -on -one rather than just through the, the website. So we created a reading group, um, which started off with the Climate Change Theatre Action Plays, which we've just done an eco-design charrette as part of a PQ Studio and um, responding to those plays. It's, it's a work, it's a project that happens every two years. It's a series of plays by five minute plays from playwrights from around the world. And we created this um, essentially eco-design charrette around it, but we also wanted to create a reading group around it so that we could um, also engage with those conversations around those texts. These are actually recorded as well so um, people can go back and, and listen to these conversations. It was done in, in hybrid format with invited guests and I'm hoping now looking at the platform almost 10 years later that it's becoming a bit of an archive as well, so, no, so an open access archive. So if anybody's wanting to go and see how ecosonography has started to transform the sector and the kind of early works of the 2014s, um, you know, they can go there and see it. So it becomes this, this archive for ecosonography moving forward as well. We now have a book club, um, which I run with Marianne, and uh, who also hosted, um, with me, co-hosted Ecosonography Day. That's us in a um, Teams talk, um, which is a really funny um, sort of thing on Teams where you can put yourself in any different landscape. Um, and, and it's a small group. It's open to anyone to come and join us. We, we run the book club like every two months, every three months. It's always responding to a different text or a play. Sometimes it's a play. 
Um, but often it's a fiction or non-fiction work, something that everybody is reading or, or wants to read. We have special guests. We had Sandra Goldmark come and talk about her book, Fixation. And it's just us sitting, you know, together online uh, talking about the books that we love and their connection to eco-scenography. Um, we were, one of the highlights is that we had uh, Gigi Buddy, who is uh, a First Nations artist, come and talk to us as a special guest in our book club about First Nations approaches um, to theatre and theatre making, and, and that was really fantastic. So we're hoping that we'll continue to invite special guests to come in um, to be part of that conversation. And again, anyone can join us for the, for the books. Time is a bit of an issue because I'm in Australia and Marianne is in Canada. Um, but if somebody from Europe wants to join me, we can do a Europe, Europe Australia edition. Um, but everything goes through the Eco Sonography Facebook group, which is um, basically where the community started, also at the same time in 2014. So everything is, I suppose, advertised through there, the, the reading groups and things come through there. Um, but it's a really great network for people to connect over anything from what kind of materials are you using to do this to um, I've got this event, I'd love to have people come to the event So or um, showing or demonstrating their own work. So, um, yeah, we've got over 2,000 members, so that's really exciting and it's been growing ever since. So there's the links if you want to connect up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, wonderful to, to, to hear about eco-scenography. Uh, our fifth uh, panelist today uh, is a person of many talents and functions. Uh, Sophie, Sophia Pantovaki is, is Associate Professor of, of uh, Scenography at the at Alto University, but she's also the co-curator of the Greek exhibition, and she also supervised the students uh, from Finland, the award-winning students from Finland. She's the co-editor of the wonderful uh, performance costume book, uh, which is on, 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 on exhibit among the non-competing uh, publications. She's also behind the critical costume is it network initiative what is critical costume sophie sophia over to you uh, uh, good morning also on my behalf i i was afraid that everybody would know what critical costume is because it's quite a big community nowadays but i also see many new faces so i hope this will be useful to some of you i feel quite dedicated to critical costume um, as an idea, as a concept, uh, as a reality, and most of all, as a virtual community, which when it comes to events, um, also here at PQ, it actually becomes a very um, touching, real, face-to-face -face, um, existing community. Uh, so critical costume is, um, na well, critical costume is a network, and we could also call it a platform because it does have a website and most of the information is on the website. However, I think that the strongest power of critical costume is the people. So I think um, that's what um, makes um, the whole idea um, concrete. The fact that we are people who are all interested in costume. Most are costume designers. Uh, and of course, most are also costume researchers, so it's a combination of the two. Um, Critical Costume was founded 10 years ago. We are celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. And it started as a conference, uh, which um, took place in January 2013. And it was not that big at the time, but it gathered uh, about 50 people um, passionate about costume and researching costume, uh, who didn't have a dedicated place, community, conference, or group to discuss costume in detail and in depth. I'm not saying that costume was not present in other places, such as um, theater conferences, film conferences, fashion conferences, but um, uh, what we lacked was the space of the experts. The space, uh, experts not only in the sense of theory, but actually also in the sense of practice. So what you see here is um, the website. You can very easily navigate through um, the materials that we have there, criticalcostume.com. 
And right after the first conference, what happened was that um, more people were interested and wanted to be involved. So um, starting from the conference, we eventually decided to create this as a wider network. And in these 10 years, we have been uh, organizing conferences every two years. And from these conferences, um, publications have emerged in different formats. So unlike many of you, we're not a publisher, <laughs> but we are something slightly different. So when you go to the events page on the website, you will have a look of the type of events that have been organized uh, by Critical Costume. Um, and besides the, um, the, the conferences, we have also had a presence here at the PQ uh, since 2015 and 2019. And also this year, we had a panel last Saturday. We try to bring communities together. So um, Critical Costume is in itself a large community, but it also embraces anyone interested in the field, not only in costume alone, but in performance design in general. And there are people from other networks and communities, such as the Oystad Subcommission, uh, and also IFTR, Sonography Working Group, and any, anyone else. So it's open. It's very important to say there is no membership, there's no fee. Um, you can just uh, email this info email um, yourself or anyone you know, your students, your colleagues who might be interested, especially in costume, uh, and be part of the community. Um, the events uh, we have mainly organized were five conferences so far. Um, and this is a screenshot from the website. If you click each one of these boxes, you can have more information on the different topics that we have worked with, starting from connections between costume and scenography at the first conference in 2013. Then in 2015, we looked at research methods and how we can study costume nowadays beyond the traditional historiographic approach. There are so many other approaches and also practice-based approaches and also approaches that come from other disciplines and how they can be specific to costume and be adapted to help costume designers articulate their ideas. Then in 2018, we had a very important topic, costume ethics. Uh, since costume um, connects so much to the understanding that we have of human representation, this is a key issue to discuss. Um, and also many other aspects regarding ethics of collaboration, for example. Then in 2020, the conference happened online. And actually, the 2020 event is the richest resource um, if you teach costume or are interested in researching uh, costume, uh, there is a very rich archive of all the presentations which were recorded on video and um, also in text format, from, particularly from 2020, where the topic was costume agency. So the agency of costume uh, in relation to, um, other, to materialities, to the other disciplines of performance and much more. And, for, and, and last, we had a conference last year, last November, all online, and um, it focused on the topic of connections. So after the big pandemic shock, we wanted to reconnect. We still had that conference online for practical reasons, um, uh, but uh, are, 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 go, are going to be um, uh, an in-person event next year. So the next conference will be next March, 2024. And if you write to our email address, uh, you will get more information. There will be a call for papers. It will talk about costume in different formats and mediums, uh, and also focus on film costume and television costume, which is not so much researched. What is very important um, for, um, for the network and the platform is that this is not a purely academic um, event, although it has a very strong academic, let's say, serious side with peer review, but at the same time, it also embraces designers. And we have formats that are suitable for designers, uh, particularly the flash talks, which are short presentations focusing on artistic work and practice-based research. They are shorter, they are um, easier to handle and organize for especially early career uh, academics or 
students who have just graduated and would like to show their works. Um, so we go hand in hand, um, let's say mature scholars um, in um, more traditional or very innovative as well presentations, but let's say those who have already developed um, further in their careers together with younger generations. This is one of the goals, to, to bring generations together and also to bring together researchers and practitioners. And for this reason, um, each of these events has had an exhibition. So each of the conferences has had an exhibition on site and when we had them online, um, we, we organized uh, equally an online exhibition. This is the, an example of the last exhibition. Three of the exhibitions are fully online. So you can navigate and see the type of work and also the practice-based research uh, by our colleagues. Um, the last one, which is called Costume Connections, uh, features 14 designers. The names are at the bottom. When you click on each of their names, you can have a look at their work. And what is different and special for this last um, online exhibition is that this time, previously we have exhibited a lot of the work, you see pictures, videos and so on, but on this last exhibition which was curated by Rosani Munith, my uh, colleague, uh, costume researcher, uh, who was also jury member here, uh, Rosani uh, worked with us um, and proposed uh, a format in which the designers talk about the work. So we see the work, but we also hear the designer presenting the work in a very personal way in the videos that are included in each designer's page. Uh, and again, this is an open resource that you could use for your research or teaching. And please do suggest to others to have a look. Oops, I'm clicking for some reason. So, um, each of the events has also uh, had some work published in a um, traditional and formal academic way, uh, starting from the journal Scene, which, uh, so, the, from the oldest is the one on the right, and on the left are the newest ones. Um, the, so, the first conference uh, and, and papers were published in Scene because at the time there was no dedicated journal for costume and that was one of the issues we discussed and through discussions from this network and in collaboration with Donadella Barbieri, my colleague um, from the UK um, and also Susan Osmond who eventually later on joined our team from Australia, we uh, launched Studies in Costume and Performance which is an international journal in English um, that has collaborated with Critical Costume um, from its very first issue in uh, 2016. And since then, every conference also has a presence in the academic format of the journals. So what I'm, um, I'm skeptical about, and this is something we discussed with Pavel uh, in relation to knowledge exchange and the, this platform and the issue of the open access, is indeed that academic publishers or commercial publishers who publish academic work usually put that, that wall. And, and Studies in Costume and Performance is a membership journal. The good thing is that it's one of the cheapest ones. So to have a personal membership is like buying a book. Um, uh, but on the other, other hand, it's not there for free. Unless specific articles. So specific articles in each issue, um, and these rotate. So they randomly change. Actually, I didn't know they rotate. But, and after two or three years, I see another article is open and another is not. So, you know, if you really carefully follow, you can download uh, each time the, the free ones. But this is an issue to discuss. And as one of the editors of the journal, in addition to being in critical costume, um, I'm trying to see w in what ways could we maybe change the profile of the journal. Um, though it is understandable that there are people working for it, they're proofreaders, and then it's also a printed, so to print something and to get people to work for it, you need to pay them. So, and membership is a way to pay them because they don't really make money. But this is something to discuss. 
Um, and um, I think we want to have some time to discuss. <laughs> uh, so just one last thing is that my concept of knowledge exchange, just going back also to, to, the, to the panel and what connects us, is how can we um, share? And um, concluding on critical costume, I think what is very important is that we have created a platform where younger and older generations, um, as well as practical people and freelancers, can share with academics and vice versa. So I hope this is, and, and I think this is what brings us together and keeps the spirit going uh, as we develop further. And I'm happy to discuss with all of you. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you very much, Brad, Teresa, Sharka, and Tanya for your presentations. Uh, we have time for questions, and this is what we are hoping for. I think we would fail as a knowledge exchange platform if we did not leave time for to exchange knowledge while we are here. Uh, so uh, we have Yero here and Marcus with microphones. Yero, there is a question here uh, in the in the first first row. Okay, thank you very much. And if you could introduce yourself, Nadia. Oh yeah, hi, thank you, I'm Nadia. Um, I'm from the UK um, at the University of Arts London. Um, I want to thank you for your um, presentations and also the great um, platform that this, uh, the, the Knowledge Exchange platform at, at KE that you've created, uh, PQ, sorry, that you've created. Um, my question is touching on something that you all mentioned to different um, degrees. Um, in the spirit of knowledge exchange, I'm wondering if you at your institutions have involved students in any in any aspects of uh, co-creating these um, these platforms that you have individually, and and if you have involved students in co-creation, then uh, what have you learnt from them, uh, or can you share your experiences of that? Sophia, would you like to start? Or? I can start, <laughs> because um, I, I also teach at a university, and um, as part of a critical costume event, uh, or platform that creates events, we always encourage the interaction with students as well. And I, I don't know if, if this is something that's useful to you, but it's something we suggest to all hosts of critical costume events, is that kind of interaction with students. And I want to give a specific example that um, we always invite students to be volunteers in events. Uh, we have done that when it was organized in 2015. But we also realize that students are not, let's say, just to help <laughs> our servants. So we wanted to give them other roles and also to make it possible for them to be part of the event. So they have been not only helping, but also rotating in attending and presenting their own work during the event. So I think this is something we always need to somehow celebrate to, to get them to present their part um, uh, while they also see what we offer them, which I see happens quite a lot here in PQ with Damo as well. So I hope this is just a start. Yeah, I don't, Brad or Sharka? Um, so I kind of, um, I share a lot of the work that we do. So I teach at the Royal Welsh College uh, on a part-time basis. Um, being quite aware that the Royal Welsh College, especially at these kinds of events, is quite prominent often as students go. We usually have lots of interns. The work usually is there. We're usually well represented. So I've kind of made a choice to kind of not involve my students um, and to be really careful about how many alumni of Royal Welsh College ended up on the website because it's an easy, it was an easy low-hanging fruit for us. Um, <clears throat> even though we have a very wide international group of students, so still just trying to be fair about it. So I often pull the work of the people we've interviewed into my teaching. So I introduce my students to the website and um, and when there's something really interesting that I think really helps there, that's in, a tangent to work they're kind of trying to pursue, we, we bring that in. But I've kind of intentionally not involved my students in that work. Sharko or Teresa? Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
I mean, I, I won't mention more the project, the associated projects that I'm doing with tangible territory, uh, such as the one I've done here, the Infraordinary Lab. Uh, that's a totally uh, collaborative uh, project that involves uh, quite a few of my students. Uh, I'm currently based in Prague before I was in London. Um, and uh, yeah, students have always been a totally sort of equal part uh, and many of the alumni stayed on as part of the group as well. So again, I think I'm, I'm sort of very inclusive in that sense and it's always been very rewarding, I think, for all involved. Okay, uh, yes, uh, first of all, I must say that I was invite to Theatralia as a PhD student, as a regular editor. So uh, Theatralia uh, really do involve students. And uh, yes, in, uh, in several ways. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, usually PhD students uh, or one PhD student, I, mean, I must say, help uh, with uh, editing Theatralia, as for example now Eliška Rajtrova and several others before, uh, including me. Uh, then uh, secondly, and I, I, I must say, I feel that they can learn academic writing, academic work, academic world from this experience. And then uh, we constantly encourage students to publish in Theatralia. And we advise them to start with short articles, for example, with book review, reviews or report, even reports on, or something like that. And uh, then uh, to go on to like bigger, bigger academic articles, uh, like studies or papers and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, we encourage also um, MA students, but uh, uh, in reality, mostly PhD students uh, tries to uh, or Want, want, want to want to uh, write uh, for Theatralia, but we also involve them into the uh, editing process to learn from them, them, and it it is always refreshing to to see how uh, these younger people then, then uh, us. Uh, see and wants, want to improve and uh, shift academic writing. So I think it's uh, important not only for them uh, to, uh, to navigate them in the academic world, world but it is very important for us to uh, not get old so quickly. <laughs> so. I, I started my platform during my PhD research as a student, as a PhD student, so that um, it's always had a very strong student following and emerging, emerging designer following. And I would say that at least half or more of people who are connected in with the Ecosonography Facebook group are, would be students or emerging designers because that's sort of where the interest is. I've also invited students to be co-editors um, in the reading group, so to help curate the reading group series. Um, we had a student that also worked as a co-editor and co-curator of that. And yeah, I think it's just, it, honestly, it's just integrated into to what I'm doing. I probably don't even think about it, whether student or professional. Thank you very much. And if I may add on this, I think one of the, uh one of the wonderful features of all the partners on knowledge exchange is they then don't think necessarily about the divide between are you a student or are you a, an established academic? Are you a, a practicing sonographer and or emerging sonographer? Uh, while some of the initiatives like Ascending started to su in supporting emerging sonographers for a particular reason of getting their career on the on the journey, the, most of the platforms simply don't think in those terms because they somehow probably don't need to. Whereas, uh, and I don't want to make it too oppositional, but but for instance, the the commercial journals 
are often tied with a kind of knowledge capital uh, that goes with a very, in my personal word, uh, exploitative attitude towards towards knowledge. So it goes with status, it goes with a position, and if you are in a in a in a senior position in a high uh, in a kind of high graded university, you are much more likely to get published uh, unless we are. Uh, for instance, as I, when I was a, a, a graduate student in a in a, a university somewhere in Central Europe that people don't know about, but of course they do now. Yeah, Sharko. If I can, I would like to add that we used to have in the Atrealia two uh, separate uh, sections uh, with uh, uh, called Yorick and Small Yorick, uh, and the small uh, Small Yorick was for uh, students, and we realized that it didn't work because there is no need to divide and and, and I I uh, have the impression that uh, that it's much more better now not to divide them. So can there I, is a question. Sorry. Yes. Can I oh, add sorry, something? Yeah. Um, something that comes out of we see it in critical costume, but I also see it more widely. That we also it's very um, how can I say it's hard to define what you mean by student. That the concept of a student, uh, especially in um, postgraduate and doctoral level, is is in a way. Um, how can I say, in, there are so many people who come back to study after having a lot of experience. And I think this is something that we can acknowledge more and more today. Perhaps at undergraduate level, you get younger people, but then at master's level, there are quite many designers who return to study after they have worked 20 years or more. I personally have a student who's worked 21 years and now came to do her master's. And doctoral um, candidates, and we, we like to use the word candidates rather than PhD student, um, also involves people who often come with a lot of uh, practice knowledge. And again, I think this is something that is key to knowledge exchange, that um, the concept between student or non-student or teacher, uh, both academically as well as from a res uh, both, let's say, pedagogically as well as academically from the research perspective, um, can um, intertwine many times. And this two-way knowledge is key, I think, when you have students who, who can be your colleagues. Yeah. Thank you, Sofia. Do we have a question here for Yero, if you could? Um, it's more of a comment, actually, because I'm a little... Hello, my name is Katarina Radova. I'm a sonographer originally from Bulgaria, but um, living in Scotland now. It's sitting a little bit uncomfortably with me, this discussion in relationship to kind of students and academic writing, because no one's yet acknowledged that you guys are on salaries <laughs> and the students are not. Does that make sense? And so the idea that something is open and equal when one's in a paid position, the other one's not, is really troubling. And that goes along actually as designers or sonographers work that actually getting into academia or publishing is still a very privileged position because not everybody has the capacity or time to sit down and offer an article for free. So can we acknowledge that? Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Sophia. I don't know if I'm chatty, but I, I was publishing for about 15 years as a freelance designer, and I know the challenge. Well, that challenge. Yeah, it is a challenge, but I think Equally, if we want to be honest, in the academic world, you also don't get paid for this work because your full-time job is already covered by other duties. I have to say that <laughs> honestly. So in both cases, there are different challenges. Of course, if someone gets on a full-time salary, there is the calmness of paying the rent. But again, you know, you, not everybody, many people struggle with that. And that is also in the academic world a big issue at the moment. Um, how much do you offer uh, out of your personal life to all of these 
um, <laughs> activities, I think none of us gets paid for any of the platforms we just described. At least I do it on my free time and on the weekends. And um, there is a lot of reconsideration as I grow older. However, when someone doesn't have a steady income, it is a challenge. And I think what I advise my students is based on my experience, which was um, an intertwining between the roles, trying to make some time, and also deciding how I manage my income. That's what I have done. I've did the whole PhD as unpaid by designing. And some of the design works, um, you know, they were put aside for travel, or they were put aside for a conference. And I see now younger generations doing the same. What we do in critical costume, because some, of course, if there's catering and so on, you pay a fee, is that we have wave fees or we have lower fees, like just for the basics of eating something. So, um, you know, but for publishing, of course, there is no fee or payment, usually. We have... Um, in the journal, try to search for funds if someone doesn't have a steady um, relationship to, to do it as a project, as a paid project. But this is case by case. Um, yeah, can I just, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, I just want to add to that. Yes, I mean, I, like you said, I think all of us are doing it uh, actually totally unfunded. And I mean, for me, I see it also as an opportunity in the same way as it's an opportunity for me to share my passions. So it's also an opportunity for the students or anyone else sharing it. Uh, and I just wanted to add uh, that actually talking of like being fully funded uh, university lecturer in the Czech Republic, it's a joke actually. The income is so low that uh, I think a lot of the foreign guests would be uh, shocked. <laughs> so I be doing a lot of work for free also. I guess my, what I, possibly should have reframed is the simple fact that even within publishing there is a privilege. So I'm not really talking about salaries here because everything is within a context. You know, we all work in different contexts that we can't change, not really. So the point I was trying to make is that even within publishing, the very fact that you're either getting to a place where you have the time or you have made a choice or not done that or not done that is a place of privilege. And I guess that's what I wanted to be acknowledged. I mean, <clears throat> I could talk about my own experience in that because, I mean, one of the, the challenges of our edition is, is just that, that I am still actually an emerging designer and while I teach full-time, not, well, I, I basically teach full-time, but that is on top of a full-time freelance career because the salary, is, you know, as other people say, isn't actually, I work a lot more hours than I get paid for on a regular basis. Um, so there's definitely been challenge, when you're talking about what the challenges of that, um, <clears throat> so there's definitely been times when I've really dropped the ball and, and definitely our publication could be a lot better than it is, but it's the fact that most of the time I'm laying out the publication at 11.30 at night the week before it goes out because that's, that is the time. So it is a privileged place that we get to do it, but I would also say that like, in my case specifically, I just did it, right? Like nobody has enabled that. I've applied for funding from a number of places, including from Oystat, from, um, you know, PQ has been really generous in, in putting us on this website. But, but yeah, so for me, for ours specifically, I understand that I've got a privilege and that I have some networks in order to like make something happen, but also constantly kind of feel this pressure, which is one of the reasons that I'm kind of letting it go after three and a half years, because I can't give it what I think it really deserves. Because, you know, you're, you're, you're literally at midnight trying to lay out a thing and staying up to two in the morning trying to put up some Facebook posts because the three, you know, we had three different people on the journey who said, oh, I'm really interested in helping you do the marketing, but never did anything. So, you know, you, we kind of started with this team of about 15 people who were really interested. And then when it came to actually doing the magazine, we were down to six. And then, yeah, and that's part of it, you know, and so people kind of slowly peeled off. But, um, so I think it's maybe slightly different than some other people, but also, yeah, I think, I think this is a general problem in theater design as well. I I mean, if we talk about it, I mean, you know, we, we've just done as part of the, <clears throat> it was really, I had this eye-opening, sorry, I'm now talking a lot, but we had, I had this very interesting experience with, um, so in the UK, what they decided to do this year within the UK for PQ is instead of having one big national exhibition, which is what's traditionally happened, they asked each region, they gave each region like a thousand pounds to do events. 
and it was really important to us in Wales because what's important to the artists in Wales is they still feel like people don't see their work. And I think that's probably more vocally evident than in a lot of other places in the UK. There isn't a sense of like community and joy in the work right now. So it was really important to us that we were having an exhibition and we went to the Arts Council and they refused to fund us because we weren't paying those artists a daily rate to prepare all their stuff and to put it in at 250 pounds a day. And we were like, we thought we were being great because in ever, when you go to World Stage Design or to participate in the British exhibition traditionally, you had to pay hundreds of pounds just to have your work considered. You know, it was 75 pounds to be considered, 75 pounds if you were in PQ and another 50 pounds if you were in the V&A. Um, and so we were like, great. That was part of that. Yeah, that was part of that. So we were like, it's free. So we weren't charging people. It was quite expensive because we had 2,000 pounds worth of Welsh translation alone. Um, but the eye-opening experience for me for the Arts Council to come back and say, well, actually, you're being abusive to artists because you're not paying them 250 pounds a day. When we were like, well, actually, we've made this huge step. It's actually the opposite. We're not charging them 250 pounds to be... And the artists that were involved were very like, oh, my God, like, you're not charging me to do this? And we were like, no. But no. isn't this about a culture of change? It's and huge, I suppose yeah. that was what my provocation was. And, you know, I felt like I was kind of met with a bit of, oh, my God, someone's complaining here. No. What I'm trying to do is actually for us all to change the culture that perhaps a contribution for these writings could be paid, you know, and it could be small, it could start small, but we're trying to change a culture where this work is being valued. I think, Because yeah, it's valuable is, and we all know that. I think for all of us, the question is where does that funding come from? Because, you know, yeah. could I, yeah, could I, you know, yeah. um, could, could, I, could I ask Sharka, Sharka's head of her? If I may, uh, I would uh, like to share my experience from the uh, perspective of uh, academic uh, based on universities. So, uh, as I uh, said at the beginning of my talk, we are simply free to do these things. Uh, honestly, we have no special budget for uh, publishing Theatralia. We, uh, we get from the faculty money for typesetting and print, and that's all. Our two editors uh, are I have to say it, uh, my boss is uh, uh, sitting, uh, sitting over there and he knows my complaints. But uh, I must say that our editors are very bad paid and uh, we consider publishing or editing uh, and publishing theatralia as a part of our free time work. And I would like to add one paradox. We are uh, encouraged or uh, mm, no, we are pushed maybe by the faculty to publish elsewhere, not in our own journals. So we basically do the service for other people from other universities and institutions. So uh, I think uh, I, 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 I thank to, uh, uh, to our great uh, enthusiasm, but I, I agree that the situation should be changed because it's, it is very bad. I, and I'm stopped complaining about our financial situation. Uh, Sophia? Yeah, and, and um, also in response to this, um, I want to give the example. I mentioned that Critical Costume doesn't have any membership fees at all. It's completely open, and that's what makes it really easy and accessible to be part of the community. But this has also created a challenge because there is no bank account and no money. So for 10 years, we maintained the website by the chair paying who, her own resources, the previous chair, and for the past five years, myself, um, the website. And when we needed to add materials and, and restructure it, there was no money. So, <laughs> and, uh, so there, is, there has to be some kind of... <laughs> so we, what we did was we um, asked the community for the last event uh, to pay a, sim a small, very small fee. So those who were institutionally supported and could get it back from their uh, institutions paid 50 euros and the rest paid 30, which 
the community was happy to pay, nobody complained, and there were very few who couldn't, so they joined us without, and that money went just to web website. So, so it was um, really, uh, although it is a very formal and um, um, network that has amazing people, m m very high level academics, and also very many young people, uh, it was an example of a, an, a free open platform, and we reached the point of needing a bit of support. So we do it, took it from the community. And um, it is an amazing discussion because we have to find solutions for continuing on such, let's say, uh, accessible open way. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you that we are starting from a position of, of uh, ethical problems uh, that are unresolved. And uh, these five people, I'm among the many, who are trying to enable a change we are not there yet but i think what we are what these initi uh, initiatives are doing is way more transparent way more inclusive and way, way fairer than for instance going on on a on a subscription website and finding a two page uh, journal from 1972 and they charge 50 50 dollars and the author is dead already who's seeing it uh, and I'm, I'm doing something that I came across two weeks ago. Uh, so I couldn't read a 51-year-old uh, article of worth two pages, but they because because someone I don't know who was charging me fifty fifty dollars for I don't know what. Okay, and. Uh, 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 but uh, please uh, let me. Uh, we we have hit half past uh, half past twelve, uh, half past eleven, and we have another panel panel coming in a minute. So please uh, uh, join me in thanking our uh, wonderful panel of enablers who are making knowledge exchange possible. Thank you very much.